Greetings and welcome to Caribbean Vanguard. If you are a returning viewer, welcome back to the channel. Fears of Jamaican enslavers apologize to the descendants of slaves. Emancipation Day is a celebration across the Caribbean on August 1st and is a public holiday on many islands. In Jamaica, the Jubilee event at Civil Heritage Park in St. Anne has been a feature of celebration since 1997. This year, there was a historical twist. Organizations and descendants of those who enabled, partook of, or profited from the transatlantic slave trade were there, virtually or in person, to apologize to the descendants of those who were enslaved. The landmark event included interventions and apologies from members of the Hears of Slavery. A group of people have discovered their ancestors facilitated or profited from transatlantic slavery. The Guardian was also represented with Joseph Hawkers, the paper's senior editor of Diversity and Development, delivering an apology via video message. Hawker reiterated the commitment made last year during an apology from the Guardian's owner to raise awareness of this brutal dehumanizing error and creating a 10-year program of restorative justice in full consultation with communities still affected by its legacy. In addition to that, I would say that we should get these people these folks who have traced their ancestries and realize that they have some connection to slave owners, we should get them to assist us in forcing their government to stop the colonialization that is happening in Africa and other parts of the world, and also to reverse the colonialization that has happened. We should not allow this thing to continue and no actions are taken because to this day, colonialization is still happening in Africa and other parts of the world. So this can be a major distraction and we should not allow this to simply stand alone. I believe that representative there, the African people should also tell them, hey, look, your people, your governments are still in Africa. They are still in Australia. They're still in other parts of the world. And I know that you are apologetic, but if you are really apologetic, Right? If your grandfather stole my grandfather's wallet and you are really apologetic, sincerely, instead of you just giving me some money out of that wallet, instead of you giving me a little bit of the money that you made off of that land, I believe that we should work on restoration, real restoration. But we need to have a plan, a 10-year plan, a 20-year plan, a 30-year plan on how we're going to regain this land from you and how we are going to be able to take care of ourselves without you, right? That sounds good, no? And they should agree with that, if they really care. Anyway, let's continue. But at the center of the event was an emotional apology from Kate Thomas and A.D. Walker, two New Zealand sisters who had traveled to Jamaica to address the atrocities of their ancestors, the Clan Malcolm of Argyll. The sister said, we acknowledge the wealth created by our ancestors through the chattel enslavement of your ancestors and the injustice of financial compensation paid by the British government to the enslavers. The enduring and damaging legacy of this injustice continues to this present day. The sisters received an applause from the audience as they pledged to continue working to turn the apologies into concrete, reparative action. Earlier on Wednesday, Walker and Thomas said that their involvement with New Zealand's Maori people had prompted them to explore their ancestry. Walker, who is a filmmaker, spoke about the trauma of having your identity stolen by colonization. My partner, she said, is Maori, and his grandparents were beaten for speaking Maori in school and we have seen the effects that losing their language had on his people. But their story also demonstrates the intrigue and complexities of reparation movement. 
And this right here, we have to pay attention to because it truly causes havoc and it blurs the line. And that is why I don't agree with it. It says this, their fourth great grandmother, Mary Johnson, was of African descent and a housekeeper in the Malcolm household. She had five children with John Malcolm, including their third great-grandfather, Neil Malcolm. So their grandmother was a divester, right? And this is my thing. To simplify that, I truly believe that if a people choose to divest, if someone choose to marry, to, uh, uh, get into an interracial marriage, then that should cancel out their chances of reparation. 100%. You benefited from marrying into the family. So you were just as bad as any other European. You can't say that, hey, one of my grandparents were African and one was not. Now, if you were raped, that's another thing. But if you volunteered, then you have canceled out reparation for your family. And to back up a little bit, the lady said that she's married to a Maori, right? And she see what her husband people go through. What that guy don't realize is that he's also making it bad for his people. There may be some benefits in there, but what message are you sending to the youth? You're telling the young man of your community that instead of them marrying a woman of the community and fix their problem, you're going to run away and marry a daughter of one of the people who's oppressing your people. Get children by them and move away. To me, that is a sign of weakness and any man who choose to marry outside of their community, if you're from an African community, if you're from a Caribbean community, African descendant, and you choose to marry out, then you are weak. You run away from your responsibility. You have a responsibility. And you deny it. You left the woman, the children, the boys and the girls, and you ran away. The sister continued in saying, we share a history as descendants of both enslavers and the enslaved. You guys see the problem there? But when you look at them, you can see that the Africans are basically gone. Right? So if we try to play the game, we are complicating things. Our history is intertwined with your history. And your history is intertwined with ours, the sister said in their apology. And you see how that blurred the lines. Where is the lines now? Now, my thing is that a lot of time we like to argue about the truth. You know, we like to get down to the truth. But what we don't understand is this. There are people, these nations, these billionaire, trillionaire nations, rich nations. They have built themselves on a foundation of lies. Right? So even though we like to say the truth shall set you free. Remember that the truth can also confine you. The truth can also make you lose your life. So we have to create our truth. If it makes sense for us to create our truth because it's beneficial to us, then we're going to have to do that. To hell we get in the truth. To hell we get in all of the facts. We're going to deal with what makes sense. We're going to deal with how do we survive? How do we move forward? And how do we regain what was lost? How do we close the wealth gap? All right? I understand people want to be morally right and all this type of stuff and sit on the street corner and argue about the Bible and what is right and what is wrong. But when you are dealing with people who don't care about the truth, then understand that you're playing a dangerous game and you're going to be here all year. That is why 200 years later, we are still in the same place. That is why 200 years later, they are moving in the Caribbean and taking over. They are the ones who are still in charge of all of the main infrastructure in the country. If you want to fly to your country, you have to get on their airplanes. If you want to travel from one country to the next on a boat, you have to get on their boat. Or you have to go buy a boat from them. If you want to be treated and get a surgery, you have to go into their hospital. If you want to get educated, you have to go to their school. So what has changed from 1834 before 1834 to now what has changed other than everyone is living better we have a car they have a jet plane 
right? So the world gap have not changed. We need to stop playing this craziness. The reason why we are here, because we are divided. We have this identity crisis and situations like this right here plays on people's heartstring and their emotions get in the way and, and they want to go on the stage and hug these ladies. I am willing to bet that a couple people cried that night. I am willing to bet that a couple Africans end up crying when they apologize. We can appreciate what they do without neglecting the fact that there are people out there who they still cannot control and we don't know the darkness that's in their heart. There are people out there from their nations who are still conducting colonialization activities in Africa and other parts of the world. They're still conducting predatory lending. They have not gotten enough. The greed is beyond your imagination. And the only way we can protect ourselves from that is for us to create some type of security around ourselves, protect our youths, right? They cannot and should not be involved with every single thing we have going on, just as we are not involved with everything they have going on. According to their research, John, who is their father, took care of Mary and their children, moving them to UK, right? So their father, who was a, a white man, got with a black woman, a divester, moved them to the UK, and he provided education and a household for the children and even leaving them money in his will. This reminds me of a story I read about in Dominica where this black woman ended up marrying a slave owner and had children by him and she ended up getting his slave after he died. So she was a slave owner, right? So that is why I say if you choose to marry, then you become complicit in the crime. Isn't that how it works any other place? If someone stole some money, and you start spending the money with them voluntarily. If you marry with them knowing that they committed a crime, then you become an accomplice. Anyway, he, their father, John, was also a complicit in the 1824 Agile War, an uprising of enslaved people which resulted in 12 men being executed. Woman used to be the bounty of war. And that instinct, that nature is still in mankind today. His people is enslaving her people. What she don't realize is that he probably couldn't get the blonde that he wanted. He could not get the woman that he wanted. And he sees this young, beautiful, ebony woman with a nice shape. And it gives him a certain type of satisfaction. Because he has conquered these people and he has their woman. He's impregnating her. He's putting his seed inside of her. And people don't understand the damages that that caused. Because now the younger youths are seeing this, not knowing that there's an engine that he does not control. Even if he wanted to, this engine is going to cause havoc in your community. Because there's a lot of greed involved there. It's like this. The kids see you playing with a poisonous snake and because you didn't get bitten, they think that they can also go play with a poisonous snake. And then one of them going to get bitten. So divestors have caused just as much damage to our community as anybody else. I heard a guy say that love is blind, referring to divesting. And I'm thinking to myself, is that a good thing? Is it good to be blind? Do you want to be blind? We say the most ridiculous stuff because it sounds good. We should get along with them. I'm not saying we shouldn't get along with them. We should appreciate what they do. We should get along with them. But they cannot control the bad ones. They cannot control their uncles. Many of them know that they have some racist uncles. Many of them don't know. They don't find out until it's too late. They spend their entire life with people. I read a story where this guy was saying that. He spent his entire life around his grandparents. And then he was shocked when he heard some racist slow out of his grandparents' heart. A mouth. So that is why we cannot put our trust in other people. We have to protect our youths because they cannot control their own snakes. I just couldn't get my head around the contrast between those two decisions and personalities. She's talking about her grandparent being an accomplice in the 1824 Agile War that caused 
12 black men to get executed and the fact that he ended up marrying their grandparents. And this is the same thing that happened here today where people say, hey, I am not racist because I have a black girlfriend or I am not racist because I have a black husband. What has changed? Nothing has changed. It goes back to what I'm saying. The wealth gap hasn't closed and the behavior is still the same. And some women need to simply understand that. A European man is going to always be attracted to a nice blonde European woman. A red hair European woman. He may like to see as much, but he's going to be attracted to the natural woman to which he come from. And I get it. The thrill, the differences, the... the excitement that people get the differences bring around it is nice right but once that wears off and a nice blonde woman walk in the room that's where his heart is going to be the lies that they told you that everybody came from a black woman is nothing but a lie are you trying to tell me that every bird came from one bird every fish came from one fish we need to stop allowing people to fool us so easily they started saying that when they realized that this would be a wonderful strategy to get back into Africa. If we can reverse what we were saying, all this stuff about us being different and better, if we could reverse it and tell them that, hey, all of us came from Africa, then we can say, hey, we are all coming back to Africa. If a lie is going to take them to the finish line, that is what they're going to ride all the way to the finish line. We are the only one standing at the starting line because we are trying to figure out the truth. Who cares about the truth? She said that she could not wrap her head around the contrast between the two decisions of her father's personality. I could not let it go, she said. And it was really the agile conflict that made me think that something needs to be said and more needs to be discovered about this. Laura Travelin, who is a British journalist and a member of the Hair Slavery Group, supported the sisters through the reparation process. She said the apology shows how global the influence of transatlantic slave trade truly was, reaching across the Pacific Ocean. Yes, an entire continent got wealthy and rich out of the transatlantic slave trade. Nothing like it has ever happened in history. Laura Travelin hoped that their actions, the actions of the sisters, that is, would open up a debate on the Oceania region about the region's historical links to slavery. The sisters have promised to ask the New Zealand government to acknowledge the link to injustices in the Caribbean and consider the 10-point plan for reparation justice created by the CARICOM community to address the persistent impacts of transatlantic slavery. The 10-point plan, which is managed by the CARICOM Reparations Commission, CRC, includes call for debt cancellation and investment in socioeconomic development in the Caribbean nations affected by slavery. This week, the movement gained fresh momentum as Haiti said it would join the commission. Accepting the apology on the behalf of the Jamaican government, the culture minister, Olivia Grange, commended the families for their action, but stressed that more work remained to be done. We have a long way to go, but we are focused on seeking reparatory justice. These apologies may be small steps, but they are important steps on that journey. It's not just about the money, but families can assist in many ways in contributing to programs that will make a difference while we push for Britain's apology and while we push for true justice, she said. Verlin Shepherd, the director of the University of the West Indies for reparation research, also welcomed the apologies, urging the families that apologize to the press governments to engage with the reparations movement, she said. Many struggles in history has seemed like an uphill task, and many of them have been successful. We never thought emancipation would come, but it did, and it took centuries. Compared to some of those moments, which was successful, this is a young struggle. We are on a path, and we will not give up. 
I've made a video on the Calcom 10 point plan before, and I've said this and I'm going to stand by it. I do not believe that reparations should be given to Calcom to pay off the nation's debt. And the reason for that is this. Caricom nations are not controlled by the majority. It is controlled by the minority. If you want to fly into your country, you have to take a European plane. If you want to leave the country, you got to fly in a European plane. If you want to get on a boat, you have to purchase a boat from the Europeans. You have to travel in their boats and so forth. The roads, the infrastructure. If you want to go to the hospital to be treated, you know who controls it, right? And not only that, but the nations have become integrated. So everyone will benefit from that. What should happen is that the families that were affected, the African people that's in the country, they are the ones who should get this reparation. The common people should get the reparations. And that is why I call on the common people. We need to start uniting around this type of ideas. And we need to speak some sense in the head of the leaders that we put in place. And then another thing, I just want to reiterate this. If an African person marry outside of the race to the people you are seeking reparations from, then you should not get reparations and your children should not get reparations. And that is common sense. That simplifies all of that argument about complexity. The sisters that you see there, they are clearly Europeans. They claim that their grandmother, great-great-great-grandmother was an African and the children got money and so forth and they totally erased the African out of them. So should these sisters get reparation?